morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. Welcome to all. I'm very happy to be here. This is the, the number two lightning talks of this afternoon on natural regeneration and secondary forest. And I'm happy that we have nine presentations. And I, I can tell you now, these, these will be very exciting because some of them are known already. And uh, I will present to you, no, first, before that, for all the people who are in the audience, that's now like 36. That's great, welcome. Uh, please submit questions in the question and answer button. Um, and in Zoom, not in Muva, but in Zoom. Then we later on, we will look at the questions and there will be a, an interaction. Um, please also indicate when you have a question for whom this question is. Is this for Tomenari, is it for Machi, for Damla, for one of the other ones? Please be, be uh, as clear as possible as you can. Also, please, if the, if the videos are running, close your cameras and your microphones, that makes, it, that makes the, the, the picture more quiet. Um, and I think that is, that's it. We have nine presentations on natural regeneration and secondary forest. The first one will be Damla Sinoglu from the University of Texas in the USA. Um, then we have Ryuchi Takashigi from the University of Kyoto in Japan. Tomenari Matsuo from Wageningen University in the Netherlands. Masha van der Sande also Wageningen University in the Netherlands. Then we have Lina Adonai Urea Galliano from UNA, Mexico. Okay. Then we have Maciek Barczyk from the Senckenberg Research Institution in Germany. We have Marcus Schorn from IDIF, that's the Center for Integrative Biodiversity Research in Germany. And Jennifer Holm, University of Berkeley, USA. And we have Tisara Ravindra Galatumbage, University of Jaffna in Sri Lanka. So that's people from, from quite some areas in the, in the tropical world. And I'm very excited about this. And please, can we um, start the presentations? That will take about 40 minutes, I think. And then we have questions and answers. Enjoy. Hi everyone, I'm Damla, a second year PhD candidate from the University of Texas at Austin's EEB program. I'll be presenting our project on the effects of gap dynamics on species coexistence in the neotropics. Competition for light is a strong determinant of species coexistence in tropical forests around the world. Here we're seeing trees of various species, all depending on light for their growth and growing their canopies plastically to reach full sunlight in canopy gaps. And we can't help but wonder if all of this tree diversity in the tropics can be maintained by variation in light availability due to canopy gaps. Recently, there have been inspiring efforts in trying to capture the tree diversity at BCI Panama. The 282 species can be categorized by their demographic rates to strategies ranging from fast growers to slow growers along the growth survival trade-off, and from long-lived pioneers to short-lived breeders along the stature recruitment trade-off. However, despite a collective acknowledgement of the significance of these demographic trade-offs, the mechanisms that allow for the maintenance of the strategies are still a mystery. And in trying to fill the gap, we ask this following question of, can the different demographic strategies that we observe in the neotropics be maintained solely through gap dynamics and a vertical gradient of light competition? We start out with a perfect plasticity approximation model. And in its essence, this approach models forest dynamics by assuming that tree crowns are perfectly plastic and reaching full sunlight in the canopy. And then we continuously build complexity to this model by extending it to a meta community of identical patches, adding density dependent crown area scaled reproduction and stochastic sand clearing gap disturbances. And finally, we parameterize our model with a wealth of empirical data coming from BCI on the five demographic strategies from four canopy layers. In the following results, we measure 
coexistence by the average and standard error of coexistence time, which is when the first extinction of a demographic strategy occurs. Here we have three different panels displaying results for three diversity levels from the same two demographic trade-off space. To have a fair comparison between the diversity levels, we found meta-community structures for each level that would give us similar average coexistence times for the neutral models without caps. And you'll recognize that by seeing that the bars on the left at each panel is around 20,000 years, but all panels have different numbers of patches that made, made up um, for that 20,000 years. And upon fair comparison, the main conclusion here is that for all the diversity levels, when we eliminate species differences with neutral models, gaps hinder coexistence. On the other hand, when species are different, gaps help maintain coexistence. Average coexistence times for the niche models of all diversity levels are higher when gaps are included, with the highest being for the five strategy models. So we've seen that meta community structure can really have an influence on the coexistence of the five demographic strategies. Such a simple way to change our model in landscape size can have drastic influences on how we simulate species coexistence. For five strategy neutral models without gaps, we observe a strictly increasing pattern of coexistence time that is greater than 100,000 years for more than 300 patches. A pattern that we expect as the increasing availability of canopy space can prevent identical strategies from basically stochastically drifting to extinction. For five strategy niche models with gaps though, we have this asymptotic pattern forming as coexistence times above 50 patches are pretty similar until the largest meta community structure averaging around 2,500 years. So not only our model has shown that these five demographic strategies can coexist for more than 2,000 years just by accounting for gap dynamics, it has also shown us that we can represent equilibrium coexistence patterns with a much smaller model space compared to the real size of BCI. In general, our simple model has shown that competition for light following gap disturbances can explain and empirically observe demographic diversity at BCI. We show that this main conclusion in our two, five, and nine strategy models, all parameterized from the same demographic space governed by the growth survival and stature increment trade-offs. However, there is still a need for mechanistic exploration of coexistence as our neutral models coexist for longer than our niche models. Thank you so much for listening to my talk and I hope you have a great rest of your conference. Hello everyone. I'm Yuichi Takeshige, a second year doctor student at Kyoto University Graduate School in Japan. Nice to meet you. The title of my presentation is shown here. Let's start it. As increasing human activity, now that about 50% of all tropical forest is regarded as secondary forest. For achieving sustainable use of forest, it is therefore important to understand the recovery processes of such secondary forest. Several studies about secondary forest recovery have been done recently. Many of those studies reported that post-disturbed forests recovered to the forest status at the secondary succession and the AGB recovery rate, especially the initial one, is high. Thus, the above ground biomass of secondary forests can reach that of mature forests within decades. However, in Borneo, although several decades passed since the last logging, we can observe highly degraded poor AGB forest, especially in the forests that experienced intense selective logging. These patches are often, often occupied by the invasive fern or vine, and those plants form dense thickets like figure one and two. This phenomenon is inconsistent with the previous report of rapid AGB recovery of the secondary forest. Fern and vine sometimes climbing up the top of the tree canopy like figure three. Those vegetation is widely observed in the locked over secondary forest landscape like figure four and five. Although this vegetation is empirically known to retard forest recovery, there's no study to evaluate the inhibitive effect of AGB recovery quantitatively. 
HIV recovery is regulated by these three factors. Generally, HIV recovery of the locked over forest is high because of the high recruitment rate and growth rate. On the other hand, in the forest with high firm by second coverage, we hypothesize that the AGB recovery rate is low due to the lower recruitment and individual growth and higher mortality. To test this hypothesis, we conducted a field survey and the whole following analysis. The study site is the Ramakot Tankra Forest Reserve, timber production forest in Malaysia, Borneo. We established 70 20 meter radius circular plots on the 20 to 30 years locked over forest along the gradient of the firm by second coverage. The survey was conducted twice. AGB was calculated from the three data with a diameter at breast height over 10 centimeter. Farm by second coverage was calculated from the aerial photo from the UAV. Recruitment, individual growth, and mortality were evaluated by these criteria. We used GLM as a statistic method. As explanatory variables, we used three, these, these variables. We selected the best model by the model with a minimum AAC value. This is the result. The forest with higher firm bind second coverage of this study has a lower a absolute AGB recovery rate than previously re reported both in the same region and in other regions. The forest with higher second coverage had a lower AGB recovery rate. The interaction was de detected and the inhibitive effect of firm bind second co coverage was critical, especially in the lower AGB forest. In the forest with higher second coverage, recruitment decreased. By the invasion of the fern vine thicket on the canopy top, individual growth of pioneer trees, which are especially important in the early stage of the secondary forest, decreased. In the forest with higher second coverage, mortality increased. I summarize the results. The results clearly showed that the coverage of firm by thickets inhibited AGB recovery by modifying the processes of secondary succession. AGB of post disturbed forest has been reported to recover quickly, but depending on the conditions, the AGB recovery rate can decrease. Our study suggests that post disturbed secondary forest may not recover to the forest theaters under some conditions like intense selective logging and following the invasion of such mantle vegetation. That's all for my presentation. Thank you for listening. Hello everyone. The title of my presentation is Vertical Light Gradients Drive Tree Performance and Forest Dynamics During Tropical Secondary Forest Succession. Trees are growing vertically to access light and also known to respond to the light gradient to increase their performance since light is a major resource on their performance. <clears throat> During secondary forest succession, trees are growing and dying which drives forest development. And this forest development is known to shape the spatial light heterogeneity in the forest which has a huge impact on the species replacement through light competition among three species. However, little is known how the spatial light heterogeneity in the forest influence tree growth and mortality patterns. This is an image of a vertical light profile in the forest with X axis of relative light intensity and Y axis of height from the ground. <clears throat> with fitting the sigmoid curve on the vertical light profile we can obtain the height of the inflection point, which is a height where 50% of relative light intensity is absorbed. With HIP, we can determine the vertical position of trees regarding light, light availability. For instance, trees above HIP are trees under well lit conditions, whereas trees below HIP are trees under shaded conditions. <clears throat> This heap is known to increase during succession. Therefore, early in succession, heap is lower and thus most of the trees are above heap. As succession advances, heap is increasing 
and thus in late successional stages. Most of the trees are below hip. In this study, I assessed how does hip influence tree height growth and mortality patterns during tropical forest succession. This study was done in Mexican tropical rainforest with using different aged secondary forest stands. And I used seven years of monitoring data of tree diameter and height. <clears throat> For each plot, height of the inflection point of vertical light profile was estimated based on the rheometric equation. For each individual in each plot, the distance between tree height and hip was calculated to see the significance of hip on tree performance. <clears throat> For tree growth and hip in each plot, in each year, I used a simple linear regression model between distance from hip and tree height growth to obtain a correlation coefficient of the regression model as an indicator of the significance of, of hip on tree height growth. This is an example of the early successional stance. <clears throat> and this is an example of the late successional stance. And to see the successional trends, I plotted the correlation coefficient against the forest age and assessed with a linear mixed model. Light blue colors indicate the correlation coefficients in early succession stages, and darker blue colors indicate the correlation coefficients in later successional stages. Trees further above hip often grow faster, which means that trees under well lit conditions generally grow faster. And light has the strongest effect on height growth in early successional stages. For the tree mortality and hip, I used the generalized linear mixed models between distance from hip and tree mortality rate to obtain a slope of sigmoid curve. This is an example of early successional stance. And this is an example of late successional stance. And again, to see the successional patterns, I plotted the slope of the sigmoid curve against forest edge and assessed with a linear mixed model. So trees further below hip generally have a higher mortality rate, which means that trees under shaded conditions generally have a higher mortality rate. And this shade induced mortality is the strongest in early successional stages. <clears throat> Take home messages. Tree individuals above the hip perform better. The benefits of being above the hip decreases over time. On succession dynamics of the forest is autogenic. Tree dynamics affect special light heterogeneity in the forest. And also special light heterogeneity in the forest affects tree dynamics. Thank you very much for, the, for your attendance. Hello everyone. Thanks for uh, watching this presentation. My name is Masha van der Zande. And I'm presenting this on behalf of many people who helped uh, assessing the soil recovery during near tropical forest succession. So we know relatively a lot about the recovery of above ground vegetation, but this also partly relies on the recovery of soils. And we still lack a broad scale understanding of soil recovery during forest succession. And to, be, to do this, we need to use the same sampling method and also same lab methods uh, to be able to compare data from different sites. So we did this and asked the question, how do soil carbon, nitrogen and phosphorus recover after land abandonment? And how does this recovery depend on abiotic conditions and the previous land use type? We expected that soil recovers, uh, that carbon recovers fastest in wet sites. Uh, because of uh, high productivity of the forest and more inputs of uh, litter. Uh, we expected that nitrogen maybe recovers faster in dry sites because of a high abundance of uh, nitrogen fixing legumes. And for phosphorus, we expected that this would decrease during succession because of the uptake by the biomass regrowth. We did this using uh, 21 neotropical uh, sites, chronosequence sites that varied in rainfall from 250 to 3000 millimeters. And for each site, we collected soils from different successional forest stages and from two soil depths, from zero to 15 and from 15 to 30 centimeters. 
In total, we had 300 plots uh, and about 560 soil samples. So we analyzed the data in the same labs using similar analysis uh, for pH, bulk density, carbon, nitrogen and phosphorus, which I will be uh, showing today, and the nutrient ratios. And as predictive variables, we included forest age, the rainfall of the site, uh, the percentage clay of the soil, the clay activity type, which is either high, indicating high fertility so soils, or it's low, indicating low fertility soils. Uh, and we have land use history type, either pasture or cropland. Uh, then we used linear mix models, one per soil variable, including the uh, effect of uh, forest age. We only included secondary forest sites, no old growth forest, because we have no good age estimation, and the interaction with the other predictors. So the depth, the rainfall, land use uh, type, clay percentage, and the clay type. So then the results. For carbon and nitrogen, we found that the recovery depends on the soil type and the land use history. So these graphs show on the y-axis uh, carbon for the first two uh, and nitrogen for the lower two. And the x-axis shows the uh, forest age. So this is the succession. And what we found is that, as we expected, that carbon and also nitrogen, they increase in sites uh, at high activity clay, so the more fertile sites and also in sites that are abandoned after cropland use. And so we expect that this is the case maybe also uh, because of the high productivity in these sites and the faster input of litter. Uh, and the cropland also because they start off having very low carbon and nitrogen values in the upper soil layers. But we found the opposite for sites uh, at low activity clay. We found that carbon and also nitrogen decreases. Uh, and we found also a decrease in sites abandoned after pastures. So perhaps these sites have lower productivity and also lower input of the litter. Uh, and the pasture sites might decrease over during succession because they start off with a very thick root layer in the upper soil layers uh, with high carbon and nitrogen contents. And this layer gets decomposed and then the carbon and nitrogen decreases during succession. For phosphorus, we expected a decrease. We also found a decrease, especially in clay sites. Maybe because productivity of biomass is higher and, the, and therefore the uptake of phosphorus from the soil is faster. And we also found that the phosphorus in these old growth secondary forests is significantly lower than the forest in the old growth forest, uh, indicating that uh, they are not returning to original values and there is maybe a phosphorus deficit. So to summarize, we find that carbon and nitrogen increase on productive sites that have high activity clay soils and decrease on sites with abundant uh, grass roots uh, in the upper soil layer. And for phosphorus, we find mainly a decrease after land abandonment, and this may point to long-term phosphorus deficit. This was the presentation. Thank you for joining. And if you have questions, please contact me. Hi everyone, I'm going to talk to you about some of the effects that John Beryl activity has on plant regeneration in a tropical rainforest. We know that through the processing of feces, John beetles can have positive effects on plants. In tropical forests, John beetles are often chosen as a focal taxon, partly due to their functional importance. However, quantitative information about the effects of their activity comes mostly from crops, grasslands or greenhouse studies. So if we exclude seed burial, few of their ecological functions have been quantified under natural conditions in tropical forests. And it's because of this that in this study, we aim to increase our understanding about effects of dome beetle activity on tropical forest plants under natural conditions. We carried out different experiments in a tropical rainforest in Mexico to answer three questions. First, we focus here on seeds embedded in feces Thus, we wanted to know if dumbbell activity decreases the spatial aggregation of seeds and seedlings and if this improves seedling establishment. We carried out two complementary field experiments for two three species using seed splicing plus with three treatment levels. One with feces and dumbbell access, one with feces and dumbbell exclusion, and one with no feces or dumbbells. And we did experiments at seed and seedling stages. 
We found that the treatment had a significant effect on the spatial distribution of certain seedlings. And as you can look at this figure for Bursera, the distance between two seeds or seedlings was higher in plus with down viral activity compared to both treatment levels where they were excluded. Please note that the same trend was observed for polysemia and it was according to our prediction. But moving on to seedling establishment, we found that the treatment didn't have a significant effect on the probability of establishment for Bursera, although it had a significant effect for polysemia. However, it was contrary to our prediction because the probability was higher in plots with no feces. For our second question, we also focus on seeds, but in this case, they were already buried in the soil seed bank. So we wanted to know how does the viral activity redistribute the soil seed bank and does this promote seedling establishment? We carried out three complementary field experiments, one with artificial seeds buried at known depths, one with natural seeds in an artificial soil bank, and one with a natural soil bank. And for the second and third experiment, we manipulated the presence of dung and beetles. Looking at this figure, you can notice that dung beetles moved very bits upwards and also downwards. And from the second and third experiment, we found that more seedlings established when dung beetles were active compared to the other two treatment levels where they were excluded. So you can see the results from these two experiments agree with our prediction. Finally, for our third question, here we focus on seedlings that were already established in the understory, but eventually could receive a portion of dung buried by dung beetles. So we wanted to know if dung beetle activity increases nutrient content in understory seedlings having positive effects on seedling performance. We worked with seedlings of six tree species under the same tree when levels where feces and beetles were manipulated. We analyzed data at community and individual levels. However, I'm just gonna show you mostly results at community level. Firstly, as you can see by this chart, dome viral activity did not increase foliar nutrients at community level. The results were contrary to our predictions and these same results we can observe for survival. But in the case of growth, we found at the community level and for just two species that dominal activity here, the green bars, decreased the probability of ruining high. After answering these questions, we can conclude that dominal activity lowers the aggregation of defecated seeds, but this doesn't necessarily enhance seedling establishment. Also, it moves seeds already buried in the soil, which promotes seedling establishment, but Dumbbell activity did not have positive effects on established ceilings. As we all know, the extensive use of dung beetles as vocal taxon is justified by their functional importance. However, such justification frequently lacks strong evidence. So it is important to quantify dung beetle functions in tropical forests to avoid extrapolate results from other systems. Before ending my presentation, we want to thank you all these institutions and people who supported this project and thank you all for joining me. Welcome to my presentation. My name is Maciej Warczyk and I will present first results from my field study in Ecuador. The title of this presentation is Seed Size Dependent Effects on Seedling Recruitment Along Vertical Gradient in Tropical Indian Forest. This study was realized within the framework of the RESPECT project, a scientific platform for ecological research in southern Ecuador, funded by DFG, the German Research Foundation. Plant regeneration cycle involves many ecological processes important for ecosystems, like seed removal, seed drain, seedling establishment, and fruit production. Abiotic filters and biotic filters are known to shape these processes at large and small scales over the globe. In my particular research, I focus on seedling establishment with a special insight into abiotic and biotic filtering in a diverse tropical mountain forest. Biotic and abiotic factors drive seedling survival in tropical lowland forests. However, there is little known to what extent they play a role in a tropical mountain forest on large environmental gradients. Here we want to ask how does seedling establishment vary along the elevational gradient? Since there are evidences for positive effect of large seed size on seedling survival in tropical lowland forests. We want to ask whether this works as well in tropical mountain forests. 
Furthermore, the habitat conversion over the last decades caused huge habitat loss and disruption of many ecological processes involving this from the plant regeneration cycle. <clears throat> With our question, we want to ask how does habitat conversion influence seedling establishment of small and large seeded species? To check this, we set up 54 subplots at three elevation, one, 2,000, 3,000 meter in Podocarpus National Park in southern Ecuador. We compared two habitats, natural habitat and disturbed habitat, by sowing seeds in forest in, and in pastures. We have sown over 8,000 seeds belonging to five native species from five families. The experiment had lasted over one year. Here we present the variation of seeds and seedlings of rare species. Clusia ducoides, Hieronima fenderi, and Okotara species. We, have, we measured several abiotic and biotic filters, temperature, soil moisture, and canopy closure, and two biotic filters, traces of herbivory and traces of fungal pathogens on seedlings. Abiotic filters responded strongly to the habitat and elevation, while biotic filters did not differ between elevations and habitats. For example, temperature decreased with increasing elevation, but only in the forest. And these temperatures were higher in pastures than in the forest, showing that the conditions in, in pastures are very different from this in the forest. Herbivory seemed to decrease with elevation. However, these effects of elevation and habitat were not clear in our models. Same, the similar results showed soil moisture and fungal pathogens. Recruitment success was a measure which we used for seedling establishment. The recruitment success was a proportion of all seedlings encountered at the end of the experiment co compared to the number of the seedlings sold, of the seeds sown at the subplot level. With this graph, we show that seedling recruitment uh, was higher at low elevation at 1,000 meter, and it was lower at higher elevations. The, the pastures and forests effects were not visible. Furthermore, we compared seed size and habitat effects on recruitment success. The, we compared two groups of seeds, small and large seeds. Small seeds are less likely to small seeded species are less likely to establish and large seeded species are more likely to establish but especially in the forest it shows that habitat effects is important for seedlings growing from seedlings from large seeded species growing in the forest we want to show that seedling recruitment was highest at the low elevation and the seedling recruitment was higher for large seeded plants than small seed plants especially in the forest the potential of large seeds should be considered for restoration efforts in tropical forests of the Andes. However, due to the extreme environmental conditions in the pastures, extra measures for seedling protection should be taken. For example, protecting protection from the sun. I want to thank for listening to this presentation. Hello, my name is Markus Schron and I'm a master's student at Leipzig University and research assistant to Nadja Rüger at the German Center for Integrative Biodiversity Research. Today I want to share the results of my thesis, where I investigated whether demographic spaces would change along tropical forest succession. Secondary forests cover ever larger parts of the tropics and we therefore urgently need a solid understanding of forest recovery trajectories. The successional dynamics emerge mainly from the demographic strategies that the given set of tree species pursue. So what is the demographic strategy? First of all, demographic rates are a species growth, survival and recruitment rates. A demographic strategy then is a viable combination of these demographic rates, taking into account that all organisms are faced with resource allocation trade-offs, meaning they have to partition limited resources between fast growth, high survival, or reproductive success. Finally, the demographic space of a community represents the range of all demographic strategies that are present in it. So as I said, successional dynamics emerge from demographic strategies. Our knowledge on them, however, ex stems exclusively from old growth forests. 
So here we ask the question, are we missing something if we only look at old growth forests? To address this question, we gathered data from four near tropical forest sites, spanning a strong rainfall gradient, which gave us two wet sites and two dry sites. We compiled Krona sequences for the four sites and assigned each available in census interval to one of three successional stages. Early successional forests cover stand ages of up to 30 years. Late successional forests cover ages of 30 to 120 years. And plots without evidence of large scale disturbances are classified as old growth forests. Then we calculated our demographic rates for each, each species per successional stage. In order to account for differences in tree size and light availability, we did this separately for discrete canopy layers that we assigned all trees to based on their size and the size of their neighbors. Now back to our question whether we were missing demographic strategies when only looking at old growth forests. We suspected that in a two-dimensional demographic space de defined by the most important life history trade-off, which is the trade-off between fast growth and high survival, we, we would miss a fast growing, poorly surviving demographic strategy confined to early successional wet forests. For the dry sites, where differences in environmental conditions between early successional and old growth forests are known to be less pronounced, we suspected all demographic strategies to be present in old growth forests. However, in our demographic spaces, depicted as two dimensional hypervolumes here, you can see that there is a su substantial amount of overlap between successional stages and that growth and survival rates derived from old growth forests are mostly representative for early successional forests. Standing out though is a group of poorly surviving but not overly fast growing species that is exclusive to the early successional stage in wet sites. So in our second research question, we wanted to know whether the loss of this demographic strategy with proceeding succession is due to species turnover or due to a change in the demographic rates of these species. For this purpose, we checked whether demographic rates of species that were present in more than one successional stage were consistent over time. Using major axis regressions, we did find that growth and survival rates were generally consistent in Costa Rica as seen here, as well as in all the other sites. That's why next we looked at the abundance over time of the poorly surviving species in the wet sites. Unsurprisingly, most of these species dis disappeared around after 30 disappeared after around 30 years of stand age. Although some species were also present in old growth forests, this confirmed our hypothesis that the loss of this demographic strategy would be due to species turnover. So overall, our results suggest that demographic strategies observed in old growth forests do miss a low survival strategy confined to early successional stages in wet sites, but otherwise reliably capture ranges of growth and survival. Thank you for tuning in and bye bye. Have a nice day, everyone. I am from Sri Lanka, Department of Agriculture, Faculty of Agriculture, University of Jaffna. Today, I present to you my research on assessment of persistent natural regeneration in Aradhapura district, Sri Lanka. It should be noted that the Aradhapura district of Sri Lanka is located in a dry zone and its deforestation is very high. Therefore, the forest department in Sri Lanka adopted the ANR method to make reforestation success. Here we assess its success rate. Here are the general and specific objectives we hope to achieve. First, we will focus on materials and method. The study area is in the Aurathapura district and replanted ANR area and natural remaining area were used, namely Mahasengam and Tumbikulama beat. Here, 2020 square meter plot of land was selected from four randomly selected locations as a sampling method, which was taken in from the forest boundary. Tree sapling and seedling were identified using the following criteria. Clinometer and meter rule were used to measure the height of plants and diameter tape was used to measure the diameter of plants. The regeneration status shown here was used to assess the regeneration level of the forest. 
data analyzed by using SAS and Excel. Next, we come to the result and discussion. Here are the identified plant species. Next, free plant with TNR sites. Total soil percentage of seedling, sapling, and adult in Tumbigulam part of Pyakanagasa replant NR area. Soil percentage is significantly higher for Maduka longifolia than Sucidium revolutum in this site. Total soil percentage of seedling, sapling, and adult in Masangam replanted NR area. Sucidium revolutum was significantly higher soil percentage in that area. Terminal arjuna was significantly lower soil percentage. The statistical analysis of turtle soil in free plant ANR sites, according to above the parameters, it was, it was found total planted seedling as well as total soil plants in the field under the same end condition of each field. Comparing most than all replants in SAS run, the analysis effect of significant value was 0.0081. Significant value is lower than the alpha value. Due to this reason, the analysis effect was significant. This table shows the survival rate from replanted plants. Here are the results of the profit analysis obtained using the table above. Next, we come to the natural maintained area. Its total sapling is 174 hectare. Total natural adult plant is 55 per hectare. Two years after abandonment of the abandoned farmland of about 100 hectares, it is natural sapling area is about 119 per hectare and natural adult plant is 55 per hectare. Conclusion, Forest Department of Sri Lanka conducted assistant natural regeneration techniques at two sites, tree planted and mean maintaining of natural regeneration forest using ANR techniques. Madhuka longifolia showed higher survival percentage in Tumbi Goloma, so that it is the most suitable plant species for replanting in that area. Sergio Revolutum showed higher survival percentage in Mars and Gama, so that Dama is suitable for replanting in that area. Overall, Sergio Revolutum and Madhuka longifolia was significantly higher survival rate of total replant plant in Amradhapura district. Although in maintained NR area was clearly shown that number of seed in suffering and adult plant were abandoned. In Maintain area of Tumbikulam number of sapling was higher than seedling and adult plant. So it can be concluded that it was fair regeneration. Number of natural sapling were higher than adult plant in Masangama abundant palm land area. It can be concluded that there was fair regeneration. We suggest the need for the process uh, outline here to make this ANR process a success. So thank you so much to all of you who listen to me. Hello, we are back. So there was one presentation was not there. Okay, that's great. So we had we had uh, eight presentations. Thanks to the presenter for their interesting presentations. And I'm so happy that, that except for one, all of you are here. There are, is now time for question and answers. Um, so please think about questions, put them in the questions and answer box. Um, and you, I think that would be great. There is also a possibility to, to use the chat to comment also to each other, direct chat. I see here in, in the question and answer, I see one question. Well, there was one question which is answered already online, but I thought it was a very interesting question. And that was a question about the impact of the fern tickets uh, to inhibit recovery in, in Borneo. And the question was for Richie. And he answered already. And, and, and so the question was, whether this could give rise to a alternative pathway to a different stable state with lower AGB, with lower above ground biomass? And he answered, yes, that's probably the case. And I think that's correct. And I think that's, in that, that's also happening in, in, in other places. 
but maybe that's a matter of time that that that, that would be my 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 point and and it could also give rise to some other species that are doing better under under these thickets but uh, but maybe further Richie, could you could you say something about this well, well thank you for explaining and um, as as Fran said, Fran said, um, we think the invasion of the fern, fern or vine can be a trigger trigger of the new sta uh, stable uh, stable stage with lower AGB, um, because the under um, because the forest with higher fern found vine coverage, and the regenerability of the tree. Uh, is uh, critically uh, reduced. Uh, yeah, that's it. Well, be, be, because if I can make a connection with the with the presentation of of Tominari on on this hip, and so when the hip is moving, there is more space below the hip to, but also maybe <laughs> there are other species that are, are coming in. So in that case, you can have a nice connection there. Mm -hmm. So let's have another question on. Uh, I see here from. Uh, Carolina Dahlstream, and that's a question for Ma for Masha. Well, Masha is, is not; she, she could not uh, stay longer. But the question is whether uh, the decline in phosphorus um, after regeneration could be due to the deforestation aspects, and that this this then takes more time. There are time lags, etc. Maybe someone else could could say something about this. So, so about phosphorus in the soils and how deforestation and growth would affect the phosphorus levels. If not, maybe Carolina. Oh, I, I think, I'm not sure if you can speak yourself. I'm not sure, I don't think so, no. Well, anyway, I, th I think in principle that is possible. Uh, phosphorus, can be taken up, of course, and it, it depends on on the on the on the timing of the replenishment of the organic um, uh, material in the soil. So it depends. It depends a bit on on also what happened with deforestation, if there was fire or not, etc. So so that's that's something uh, that maybe later on you could ask to Masha directly online. And then there was another question of Carolina Dolstri for Marcus. Well, nice talk, she said. The low growth and low survival strategy is interesting. Yes. Do you think these plants that, uh, that uh, with that history? Um, huh? Oh yeah. Well, they could have been reproducing before dying. So so they they grow slowly, have a low survival, and then in the during their slow growth, whether they then could be dying. I I yeah. And um, or maybe they were not in their proper niches or stochastic deaths. So that's a complex question, uh, Marcus. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so I think part of the question was whether these species really do follow this uh, this strategy or whether they were just in in the in the wrong niche. Uh, also, and so I think one reason why they have this uh, low growth rates uh, might be because uh, we did cover uh, the whole life cycle of these species. Like as I as I showed in the in the follow up graph, uh, most of these species faded out after around thirty years, and that's our early successional stage was from zero to thirty years. So we actually covered the full life cycle. So also. Uh, probably life stages where they did not grow very fast anymore, but uh, started to die. So maybe, yeah, they would, uh, their um, growth rate would be higher if we only looked at the first 20 years or so. Um, and the second part of uh, the answer might be that um, the, most of these species um, are actually as associated uh, with early successional stages um, or with gaps uh, in old growth forests. So they are really light demanding species. Um, so I don't think they were in a wrong niche, um, but yeah, they really partly followed this uh, strategy, but they might have higher growth rates uh, than what we saw here. 
Okay, and and is it possible that that because most of the of the pioneer species that are woody species that live longer than thirty years, only a few species that that die before, is that is that something that is important in the forest, or is that a large number of species? Um, that finish the life cycle before thirty years. Um, no, as, as uh, you saw, it's, um, it's um, only a small uh, fraction of the species and it's only this very tiny uh, fraction of the demographic space too. So like most of the species, they uh, overlap with old growth uh, forest demographic species and it's only this small fraction um, yeah, of really early successional species maybe. Yeah, because the interesting thing is that that as field people, we think that some of these pioneer species are really having a special a special case uh, in early history. But that's only a, um, many of these species live longer than thirty years, and so it should be a very a very specialized group of species that are, that is done before thirty years that finish. Yeah, no, but that's interesting, Marcus. Um, I have a look and whether we have other questions and there is comments on amazing presentation etc and yes there is a, um, a, pre a question uh, for magic you mentioned the temperature and the pastures you planted your seeds did not decrease with elevation even though there was a, a thousand meter altitude difference between your side why is that yes that's a good question yeah, that, that's, that's interesting. It's actually the measure was the the mean maximal temperature. Then it showed that the pastures they receive uh, quite a lot of energy from the sun, and apparently, yeah, like the the mean temperature was was even higher than at two thousand meters, and yeah, didn't decrease with elevation because of open space there. Yeah. Okay, it's, it's, so the, so in, it's in, in forest it was decreasing, but but not in the pastures. Yeah, yeah, the pasture is then direct light and direct, and the the air mostly is is more clear upper in the mountains, so it would have a really stronger effect, and that would compensate for the the altitudinal change. That's what you're saying. Okay, exactly. that's uh, that's an interesting. I I hope that's that that I think that's the answer to this question. Then there is an, another question from Megan Sullivan. And that's a question for Damla. Uh, Megan, loved to see your talk. That's a good start. How do you think increased size or frequency of gaps eh, from natural or anthropogenic disturbance might affect your results? Thank you so much for the question, Megan. Um, so we're using this, uh, the gap frequency that was like remotely sensed for BCI. So it's like an empirically confirmed frequency that we're using. Um, and I had tested um, just what, when I was like building the model to see if like other frequencies would um, change the results. The general pattern of um, gaps um, helping maintain coexistence um, of the five demographic strategies remains, um, but the crown area patterns um, throughout succession are um, affected with, with the change in frequency of the gaps. And then for the size, um, since it's not a spatial model, we're not really accounting for the size of the gaps. It's just um, the frequency of the disturbance. So I don't know if um, if it would um, have, I mean, I, I would think like I would have the intuition that like if it was a spatial model, it would definitely have an impact on, um, I think the, again, the patterns of like crown area dominance through time. Um, but yeah, I was really happy to see that like patterns of species coexistence were not changing with um, with frequency of gaps that are um, that are like below that threshold of which like it would it would allow for like forest development to occur. Obviously, if it's like too too frequent and we're not seeing a forest develop, then we're not seeing the four canopy layers develop. Um, obviously, coexistence patterns are influenced. But yeah, thank you. Yeah, and, the, and that's based then on on the fact that most of the gaps are small in the study. Yeah, they're pretty infrequent. Um, they're they're at the peak. Yeah, which natural gaps occur, so it's not um, completely dom like over dominating the forest. Yeah, but it's it's also true that that of course if you have hurricanes and selective logging and really bigger gaps, not uh, five hundred or several hectares, then then this would have a strong effect on on your results probably. 
Yeah, and we're also not, not? Um, those sorts of, uh, for those sorts of disturbances, I think um, a lot of other processes would also change, like um, the seed bank and the soil, and we're not really um, accounting for those, um, those processes really in the model. So um, yeah, I think, yeah, if, I, if we were to have this very detailed model in which we're kind of taking all of those mechanisms into account, it would definitely have a, have a big effect. But that's your your next project, eh? Tamla. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully. Yeah, I think, on, yeah, on, especially on, hurricanes so are. The Megan are would be very happy if, if you would do I, I see here. So that's, uh, that would be great. Yeah, thank, thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Again. I have a comment <laughs> yeah. here from, from Giovanna. Well, Giovanna, hello. I, I hope you're doing fine. You enjoyed the presentation. That's very good. Well, I have a question also. So I was wondering, and that's my question is too much yet. So you were talking about these, these cheaping recruitments and, and, and the forest pasture uh, had not big effect, except for the big seeded uh, species, you said. But then at the same time, if, if I understand you well, you did this with five species. So are you now talking about um, large seeded individuals? Or the number of seats, or because if five, then then maybe I missed. Yeah, some. it's you, can you? Yeah, it's on, it's only five species. It's it, there were only five species. It was quite hard to find more seats to only such a big numbers. And yeah, we had two large seeded plants, and I mean two large seeded species and three small seeded species. Okay, and so so the generalizations that you do now is based on two species versus three species. Yeah. That's that's a, that that's true, of course, but I understand why that is. Yeah. Um, and so the focus of your study is more on what what is happening within species, in fact, be, be, because they don't have enough like... seeds. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you. I, yeah, I, I was surprised that there was so little effect, and I'm I I, I I in general, I mean. The, the first thing I would expect is, is the forest pasture difference, but that's uh, that's less important than the altitude of the difference. That is that is uh, nice. So I don't see any questions. Maybe there is in the chat. Maybe in the chat. Let's have a look. Uh, Let's tell me who for the phosphorus question. Yeah. Okay. Um, so are you having questions for each other? Someone else was looking at yeah, the presentation uh, of somebody else. Yeah, Don't I have one to Marche, in addition to the France's question before. So thanks for the nice presentation. So I was wondering about the differences among species. Did you find any differences among the species in terms of the regeneration successful in pasture or in forest? Thanks. Yeah, like the, the one species was generally more successful than each other, but uh, yeah, we decided just to divide the species or to like to group them into groups, the large seeded and small seeded ones. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's yeah it's quite difficult to find patterns there, um, yeah and there were also two more species which were uh, excluded from the from the comparisons because yeah they had basically no no success in recruitment yeah but this in general this study system in tropical mountain forests is pretty hard yeah. to yeah. <laughs> To find patterns and also like it was quite puzzling that this bi biotic factors and yeah. we, we also started with some treatments with biotic mm -hmm. um biotic filters and it didn't give any response so it, it may look very simple but it's like it is yeah yeah, yeah but that, in general it's quite a challenge of these in these gradients because to have sufficient replication and things like that. Even even in a more simple system, it's it's already complicated, let alone yeah. when you also take these things into two uh, elevational gradients and elevational gradients, you have all these microsites all the time. So there is a continuous un, uncontrolled environmental variation 
uh, in the soil and in the in the climate and exposition and how much time sun is there, etc. So so that and the and the cloudiness that that varies also a lot. So so it's much more complicated to work along altitudinal gradients than than in in flat areas, and that's that's maybe why so many people choose flat areas because it's it's easier. So that's a challenge. I had a question for Tisara. And so you were talking about this assistant natural regeneration. You have these two sides. And so in one side, one species did best and the other side, another species did best. And then you suggest that, that this would be a, a, a modus for work. And I'm wondering whether you then suggest that this one species will be planted all over because then you get a natural regeneration or a assisted regeneration with only one species. Or do I misunderstand this? Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah. Uh, in Sri Lanka, the forest department uh, adopted the NR method to make reforestation uh, successful. Here we assess the, uh, it's successful. So uh, in that uh, NR replanted, both NR replanted NR area, uh, same plant was uh, replanted, uh, but the thing is, uh, some planted uh, not uh, regenerated uh, successfully. But Sisygium uh, revolutum, other uh, other side, then uh, another side, Sisygium revolutum, uh, high uh, regenerated, but the uh, another side, Sisygium uh, revolutum, not. Uh, high um, regenerate. Uh, so we uh, conclude uh, what which plant uh, most of most uh, suitable for that uh, sites. Uh, yeah, I understand that, but that means that at the end, if you only plant the ones that is most suitable, that you get a in a, 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 a basic system with one species, and that's. That, that depends a bit on the goal why you are doing um, ANR. I think that's a, that's a, yeah, to think about. Yeah, it, it was challenging me, so. Anyway, thank you very much. Any other questions for each other? There is one way, question you, on Q&A. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. There is one on Q&A. Ah, there's a new one. Okay. Luisa Jenis. Thank you for your great presentations. Question for Lina. Lina, for you. Would you expect to see different results in, in terms of dung beetle mediated nutrient cycling affecting the seeding establishment if you had to use a different dung source? Um, I think that probably, but it will also depend on what kind of dung, right? When we think about native dung, it means that dung from animals that are inhabiting the forest. I will say that we have seen that uh, holler monkey dung can have a rich amount of nutrients that can be absorbed by plants. And also it has been found that same with elephant dung. And so I think that even though the quantity of nutrients that each dung can have, there are some amount that can be trans that can be incorporated by seedlings. So it will be different if, for example, we use uh, dung that are not coming from uh, the forest, like for example, domestic, uh, down from domestic pigs, that the diet could be kind of different, not like the same that happens in the, in the forest. But I think that it would also not just, it is interesting not just looking at the amount of nutrients that are coming from the dunk, but also which kind of seedlings are we working with? Because uh, it had been seen that, for example, that uh, seedlings that are, that are sand demanding can show incorporate can show uh, response to dunk additions, but when you see when you do the same experiments with shaded seedlings, those seedlings cannot incorporate them as quickly as you can see with the light seedlings demanding. So it will be uh, it can be a matter of the dunk, but also it can be a matter of the seedling functional traits. I think so. Okay, no, that, that's interesting because I can imagine that a, a dung from an animal that is only eat, eating eating leaves will have a very different composition than dung from animals that eat fruits 
yes. or animals. And, and so then the concentration of nutrients and different nutrients will, will, will be there on the plants. So, so, so that should have, uh, to some extent, that should have an impact. And, and the one that you say about the understory plant and the, and the fast growing plant, you would expect the fast growing plants to need more nutrients uh, and having a quicker response to a change. That's, that's in general what, what, what fast growing plants do. And, and, and so, so that's, uh, that's also very interesting. That's an interesting question. Thank you very much for the answer, Lina. Lina, by the way, you send regards to Ellen. Oh. I haven't seen her for a while. Of course, I'll, I'll send her regards. I, I saw it, yes, great. So any other questions? Because we have, I think we have, it's uh, 18, uh, it's 53. So we have a two, two more minutes, something like that. So there is time for another question or another comment. I see people want to go for a beer or a glass of water. That's also good. Well, then I would really like to thank you all for your exciting presentations and uh, on your exciting work. Um, and some of you I will I will see early on on, on more details of the work. That, that is very cool. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. So thank you all very much for your presentations. Thank you also all the participants for the contributions and the questions and the interactions, very nice. And thank you, Marcelo Kubo, for making it all possible that it went smooth and everything. Um, I think that's it. There is possibility if you want, you can continue discussion on MUVA or with asking individual questions. It's all on, on the list of the, of the 600 or something participants. So find the name and, and post a question. And if not, Enjoy the rest of the day. Enjoy the afternoon. I am enjoying the evening now. And uh, see you next time. And maybe tomorrow in another meeting. Have a nice day. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks a lot. <laughs>